Thank you everyone for coming. I am Nora Medlin. My uh, session here today is on maximizing project success and high value partnerships. I have over te two decades of experience in technology. Back in 2006, I got my bachelor's in networking technology. Uh, quickly went into software development though. I really was thinking I wanted to be a server admin, but eh, decided to get into software development. Uh, about 15 years ago, I really started in the Drupal sphere, drupal.org slash technora. Um, and uh, between 2013 and 2017, I went for my, my master's in uh, innovation and entrepreneurship as well. So I've been heavily you know, embedded in business development and process improvement um, really well over two decades. And I would call myself language and platform agnostic at this point, uh, though you know, definitely more uh, focused on the Drupal end and the open source community in general. Uh, as, as you know, what a person with that experience, I've also picked up some analytics, uh, sort of uh, uh, you know processes along the lines, and uh, delve into some Python as well every so often, uh, transforming data you know from one system to another, for instance. And I help improve improve market share via strategic initiatives and process improvement. Um, as a servant leader, I can achieve continuous learning through mentorship and facilitation. Uh, but more, not enough about me, let's get started. <laughs> I would say that every project starts somewhere. And <clears throat> there at the beginning of your project, I think honestly when it comes to project success or maximizing your partner's success, you really have to have that internal sales handoff. Uh, I've actually been surprised by a lot of agencies that I've worked with and not having this initial process occur, you know, just being handed a document and okay, go now. <laughs> Let's have you uh, run everything. But just simply having that meeting to uh, you know, not only go over the contract and understand the scope and everything that's under that contract, uh, but some of the nuances you know, that you might not otherwise have uh, been able to obtain about the personality of that particular client and or the resources that may or may not have been identified internally that wanna be uh, used for that particular um, uh, project. So it's really important to have this internal sales handoff. Uh, things like um, uh, you know terms and scope again are important, uh, but again some of those nuances are really important as well. Uh, a fast follow to this might be a uh, client PM intro. This is especially in, uh, important, I think, if you have a larger team on either side, and just having that initial uh, meeting uh, touch base with that uh, client contact, that point of contact uh, with the new PM. Uh, it's really important to identify if you have a good fit with that client, uh, and as well as to identify some initial steps uh, during the process. If you already have a previous relationship or engagement uh, with uh, uh, your uh, client, uh, you may not need to this, but uh, with it, especially with a new engagement for an existing client, uh, after that is initial sales sync, uh, you would want to have your you know official. Uh, email that you might kick off to that uh, client and invite them <laughs> to have a kickoff workshop with you. Uh, what you're doing here again is to reinforce those agreed goals, uh, any communication plan, and if you have an initial timeline, you could include that here, but it may not come until a little bit later. Um, in this example, we have the you know client relationship or it exists, and you might also include an easy schedule link, something like Calendly or MS Booking. Uh, having to email back and forth a million times just to get uh, you know <laughs> that initial call scheduled is probably not the best uh, experience so having a tool like Calendly or MS Booking to help facilitate that is really important as well. Optionally you might include something like an inclusion or accessibility statement. I've had uh, situations and I think it's fairly valuable to at least call it out in the initial uh, uh, email to them that you are open to uh, having, uh, you know, breaks if, if requested, let's say, throughout the kickoff workshop, um, or if there's any, you know, sort of other accessibility uh, concerns that might need to be addressed as well. Uh, <clears throat> you can also utilize this for lead role changes. I think there's often a case where you go from one phase of a project to another, um, or you, you know, are just shuffling resources around on the agency side, especially. And it might be useful to have an initial or an additional um, sort of meeting uh, or mini kickoff uh, with uh, the clients um, as well. 
and this might serve that purpose. So, you know, this, I want to ask maybe the room here in general, what do your initial communications look like? Do you utilize just email or Slack or do you have some sort of form that you might send to your clients? Uh, what kind of initial communications might you all have? Anybody in the room? I think we operate a lot like kind of how you explained uh, the sales to production handoff. Sales is, production? Um, that's key to review the contract even though production probably quoted most of it. Right. Just to get the, yeah, the client candor just how, how they like to communicate. Um, Some of those nuances. It's important. Mm -hmm. Anything specific with uh, uh, the sort of email communications or initial communications with the client for that PM? I think our project managers probably uh, looking at like a Calendly or something else would make that that process awesome. easier. But yeah, email is the king for us at the moment. I've also heard some people talk about questionnaires. Anybody use questionnaires as their initial contact? socialize that around some of our departments to mm -hmm. capture those initial questions that we all need to know um, to then hopefully schedule a meeting. I think those are meeting, email, and then trying a new form. Mm -hmm. So it might be like business use case, a questionnaire, exactly. that goals, sort of thing? Audiences, goals, audience. To focus. Sure. Exactly. So it helps us understand our tactics and get on the same page. More strategic meeting. level at the beginning, right? Okay. Anybody else have initial communications they want to share? Alrighty, so moving on here. Uh, when we are kicking off, we do need to have that early alignment and setting the tone like you're talking about. Um, the purpose of this here with the initial kickoff is to align with the, you know, all the teams. I mean, we're not just talking about between the client and the agency, for instance, but also uh, between, you know, several teams that you might have on either side. Um, it's also a good idea to include the, uh, you know, they have the inclusion uh, end of that in there as well. Uh, meaning that uh, it, it, often I find that with kickoffs, you only have like the meeting with uh, just the single point of contact on the client side or this or the single uh, lead developer on the internal side. But I think re it's really important to have as many in the room that makes sense. I mean, we don't necessarily want the entire team on both sides. But if you have several stakeholders, you might have key stakeholders in that room. Or on the uh, internal side, you might have not only the lead developer, but also the lead designer and also the QA uh, lead, things like that on the internal side as well. So, in, you know, in making sure to include um, as many as early as possible, uh, even including the design team, for instance. Uh, it, you know, this pro provides a, quite a bit of transparency during the kickoff as well. But really my main points here are um, it's easy to do the contracting, I think, and as well as the you know, implementing end of things, but you know, if you lose those touch points and those that setting that tone in the initial kickoff, uh, it may provide, uh, may uh, create a lot of risks uh, with your project, like delays, overruns, missing your milestones. You know, it can, the list can kind of go on and on. <laughs> so, uh, you know, really the point here is with the kickoff that you want to identify early. Some other things as well, uh, if you can, uh, to uh, identify your resources on your side. Uh, and any other client contacts that you might need to capture as well. And this might be, let's say, that there's a Salesforce integration. Well, who is it on the, on the client side that is responsible for the Salesforce administration, for instance, on their side? <coughs> and then you might want to leverage templating as well. Just as a side note, you know, I think that as you go through your business process, any sort of improvement that you can make in any templating that you can share across your agency uh, to improve and use uh, every time to provide some consistency there, uh, leverage that template if you can. With the client kickoff, uh, you know, it, during the actual meeting is what I'm talking about here, uh, you want to reinforce those goals and any sort of communication plan that you might have uh, already decided on uh, as far as how to be communicating with the client. Some clients um, may not know that you have uh, Slack or something like that that they can get invited to. So really asking them how they usually communicate or options that they might be interested in communicating with you specifically on that particular project. <laughs> so inviting them to, into a guest um, uh, a Slack channel, for instance, might be very valuable to a client. Uh, and deciding on that communication plan early on uh, might be part of this workshop or something that would be uh, decided prior to. You might think about the timeline as well. You know, I think it's something that we, 
you know, as project managers, um, we're a little nervous about setting a hard timeline, but if you can at least get the snapshot of the initial, you know, sort of few weeks that are upcoming for a client, they know when and where to arrive in order to uh, keep engaged during those initial stages, especially. Uh, your agenda items during the initial kickoff uh, workshop, uh, you know, just intros, I think, honestly, are really important, going around the room and talking about yourselves and who you are and what you do, um, and specifically what's your role on the particular project. You might also include some sort of icebreaker, and I would say that when the icebreaker, it's a common thing to have, um, but try to stay away from like common sort of questions that may not really open them up to um, talking, you know, to revealing like more about who they are and what they're about. Something more like, what's your favorite movie versus, um, or something like, what did you do this last summer for vacation? You know, it might be more telling than, uh, you know, uh, what's your favorite, uh, oh, I don't know, color or, or you know something more ambiguous that that's not as relevant. So yeah, include your icebreaker, but be maybe a little bit more thoughtful and try to make it a little fun to kind of go around for that icebreaker. Uh, you want to call out your individual success factors. Like, what are you looking to get out of the project? This is especially important, I think, when you have a, a, several stakeholders. Maybe you know not all of them been in the same room at the same time before, and you know they might have different goals than what they had initially thought as well. So just being able to call it out there uh, during the kickoff workshop might be valuable there. Um, you know, it might um, also uh, create some risk. I think that you want to be a little bit careful about that if there's some internal politics that you might need to be aware of, which is why an initial you know, sync with that POC on the client side might be valuable uh, just to be asking those questions. But um, just wanted to call that out here that if you do dive in too much into what are your goals here at this kickoff workshop there? It might fire off some arguments <laughs> and conflicts that you didn't anticipate. Uh, so just to keep an eye out on those. Um, but the opportunity here is again to you know grow and create new uh, relationships between the department heads and their stakeholders on the client side or even internally. There may be that you have larger team, 100, 200 people, um, or even just a 50 person agency. I would say that there's often cases where a team member might not have worked with another team member. Uh, so just being able to, you know, have that opportunity to get them to meet and greet with each other as well. Um, you might include meeting cadence in with the timeline as well, just to set some expectations around that snapshot at the beginning. Uh, but it's optional. With your internal kickoff, you know, I think that often I've seen as well that the uh, external client facing kickoff is the only kickoff that happens, but it's important also to have an internal kickoff. This is where you're not only going to go over your client overview timeline and scope with your internal team, but you're going to have the entire internal team. Now I'm not just talking about the leads, I'm talking about anybody that you've identified that might possibly be touching uh, this project. It could be DevOps that might not have been in the room for your external client, but for your internal uh, kickoff. Uh, you'd want to include some of those other resources that are going to be uh, working on, on the project internally. Um, this will give them the time to not only do their intros, but more importantly, I think, is to get that onboarding uh, par uh, portion started. Things as simple as links to your project resources. Uh, are we using JIRA or whatever standard uh, project management software that you've used previously? Or are we using it, the clients? Um, what are the links to the uh, repo, for instance? <laughs> you know, some of these things, are, it's interesting I've found that there might be a, a kickoff and, you know, an intro of, you know, who we are and what we're about individually, uh, but it might take a week or two to get those, <laughs> you know, additional project resources shared out to everybody in a Slack channel, for instance. And so having that ready to go right off the bat, um, and I found also in Slack, by the way, if anybody uses Slack, I don't know, but uh, some of the uh, Canvas sort of features that are in, in Slack, if you've seen Canvas, have been useful as well as, as a place to put all your project resources or just use something like your uh, project um, <coughs> documents and or Confluence or something like that, but somewhere that's standardized across uh, all projects if you can, you know, as you go through and, and iterate off of your previous as well. Um, it's important to have roles called out because not every team member is going to be doing the same roles across all projects necessarily. You might have, for instance, a front end, back end, full stack type developer that on one project is serving as the front end dev lead 
and another project there uh, functioning as the back end dev lead. So it's good to call out your roles. <coughs> Uh, with meeting cadence here, I think it's a little bit more important on the internal side because you need to make sure that we're all in agreement of, you know, what uh, and how many meetings are appropriate for that particular project. Not all projects need to have the super heavy all cadence items, you know, included for every single sprint. It may be more useful to have uh, every other day stand-ups, for instance, or beginning of the week stand-ups for a particular project. It really depends upon how. Um, intense or you know if your milestones and things like that you know how many resources you're going to need on the project full throughout the week or you know that sort of thing uh, as far as uh, next steps are concerned you would want to include those as well just to make sure that it's in everybody's mind that yes we are going to have a stand-up or yes we're going to have a planning session uh, during you know these uh, initial uh, sort of weeks or sprints identifying any gaps honestly I think that if you do have another feature, I think of this is that during your internal camp kickoff, you can identify, you know, any roles that might be missing. You know, just going through that initial timeline and scope with the developers or the designers in the room, you might identify that there's some gaps in either talent or time, um, or you know, otherwise with any vacations that are going on, that sort of thing, and, and being able to identify those resourcing needs early on is important. Uh, in, for very, very large projects, I would think with like, multiple sort of internal teams that might be working on a specific feature to feature, that sort of thing, you might optionally do this as just a team lead across all teams sort of meeting and then have your separate sort of raw, raw meetings uh, with your individual feature teams, that sort of thing. Okay. So after we've done the, done the kickoff, I think it would be, you know, good to call out here that it's easy to lose steam and so it's important to keep iterating you know the uh, reiterating the purpose and the value of the project and you know how do we do that I think that there's a few steps that you can take initially to uh, you know keep that momentum on the client side and working with your internal side to some degree as well but uh, more on the client side um, you know just being able to identify things like who are the best people to contact when? So using a chart like this, if you'd like, you can scan for the Miro template here for the RACI um, stakeholder analysis template. Uh, but more or less, um, the idea here is to get, a, or it, to get an idea of who you should contact and how frequently and for what issues. Um, <clears throat> so again, you might go through this exercise specifically for a client, uh, but I'll, to be honest, most of the time, I just keep this in the back of my mind and instead use a confluence page with a list of stakeholders and with their roles and maybe like a little blurb about what they're actually responsible for on that particular project. Uh, so in the, in the example of a Salesforce admin, you know, that sort of thing would be an example there. Um, then you would want to take this information and maybe have that, that sort of landing summary page on your overview page for the project and just place it there. But make sure to review that with your internal team as well so that they are aware of who to contact when. You know, I think that really the purpose here is to reduce noise. Um, often I've had the situation where there's everything is being sent to everyone because we don't know how often they need to be contacted for something and then uh, messaging will be missed, you know, and things uh, will not happen when they need to happen. So having everybody on the same page of like what kind and being open to ask those questions about should I you know, send this to which audience is a good question. Um, it also is good reference for PM coverage. So you know, PMs need to take breaks too. I think every once in a while we gotta go to a camp or something you know, and do something else for a week. Um, so you know, just having this as a reference for uh, PM coverage is a really uh, good idea as well. One story I'd like to tell about this um, is in the example of a point of contact that was what I'd call an extreme SME, subject matter expert. Uh, they were triaging support tickets from end users daily and asking for frequent updates in Slack. And uh, the, actual, the actual decision maker was uh, somebody else entirely, and they were not technical at all. Uh, they only cared about how many updates uh, uh, you know, were, or what updates were done related to their marketing department that often that, you know, they will have a stakeholder or point of contact, a decision maker that's in a non-technical role. Um, and they don't want to know about JIRA tickets. 
They just want summaries and statuses, right? So it's good to have a good idea of, um, you know, again, who to contact, when, how often, and this uh, racy chart might help with that. <clears throat> After kickoff, this is another bit too. You know, I think as a project manager, we're kind of used to, or project managers are relatively used to sending some sort of summary after a meeting. Uh, but, you know, this one I think is one of the more important ones, is making sure that everybody's in alignment after we have met during kickoff to send that next step email to get them ready for what those next steps are. You would want to include that meeting cadence, especially more important as you get into this uh, email. We want to decide on that meeting cadence and that snapshot timeline of at least the you know, first few weeks or sprints uh, that you're going to be going on as well. Any decisions that might have uh, been made since that kickoff or during that kickoff as well should be included as well. Okay, this is where I probably get into a concept that a lot of people that uh, have worked at agencies for a while um, have tried to implement. Um, and may or may not have been as successful. So the idea here is that instead of having this sort of situation where you have a project where you have a cart before the horse sort of syndrome going on, you don't know what you don't know until you get into it. Uh, you might sell something that's kind of smoke and mirrors and generalized as far as requirements go. And, uh, and, and you might even have a lot of meetings that happen during the first phases or first sprints of the project uh, with little output. So, you know, I think if you think about this discovery first, to avoid the pit, this pitfall, it's clear to have a clear set of, um, or it's good to have a clear set of criteria towards project goals. It helps bridge, helps bridge the gap between research strategy and implementation, but really it helps to, uh, this can be applied to any, like going from one phase to another. I think that, you know, if we think about this at least with from a basic standpoint of discovery first, um, we'll, we'll be able to take some advantages along with this. So what, I, what do I mean by this? Uh, with, this is a world without a discovery first approach. Uh, you might see this a lot where you're going to get your proposal and sign agreement. You're going to, uh, you know, start your design and or proof of concept, but uh-oh. We found out about something we didn't know. Now we have to go back and get a change order. We need more money, we need more time in order to complete whatever it is. Okay, let's go back to design and POC. And maybe we'll get to build at this point. Maybe we'll be ready to do that. But a lot of times you'll identify things during build as well and have to go back for another change order. So this is in the world of, or especially you're contracting for the full project um, and you're not really leaving open for uh, changes and you have to do special change orders. Uh, uh, one example I'll provide here with this is a higher ed redesign from a D7 to D9. Um, uh, the client wanted a decoupled Drupal backend using Layout Builder with Gatsby front end and the developer on their side was gonna own all of the Gatsby front end work. Uh, sounds kind of like a nightmare to have clients involved with development, you know, to some extent, right? Um, cherry on top though is content migration was also included in the scope so that can be a challenge especially if you have some other front end that you're having to deal with. Um, as we were architecting the migration plan we came to find out that nearly everything was built in panels. Yay! So we had to renegotiate with the client which I mean that's conflict resolution is part of the job right? Um, but we had to renegotiate to uh, have them help out with some of the content. We would help out with some of the content um, and go back and forth um, and rewrite some of that content completely. You know, often that's the case. Um, and, you know, I, I think that project managers are used to doing content creation to some degree, right? But if we have a good idea about what that content, what that data structure looks like as early as possible, uh, you know, I think we would have more success in general. So have anybody else experienced this before? You know, just having this sort of cart before the horse, as this sort of don't know what you don't know until you get into it. Any horror stories that anybody wants to share? Or just, you know, learnings that you might have had from a project? Well, it's not a horror story per se. Sure. I mean, it's more along the lines of, I came into this team and they've been doing work that way for like a decade. And it's taken us like five years to clean it all up. So definitely, Discovery First is a much better approach. Okay. 
So you've been able to use that at least to some degree. Yes, we, yes. Yeah, we, we transition everything and we do all our new projects that way. But yeah, like I said, it took us five years to clean up the mess that was created by this kind of approach. So, right, yeah. right. Yeah, we, we want to we wanna think a little bit more in an agile sort of way, right? right? Yes. Okay, anybody else have another story? Yes, no, I might hear no story, story? No, okay. Too many to tell. Okay, not enough time. All right. So, no, we got it, though. We understand what that means. So, um, I would say that this discovery first approach, just to really nail it home for anybody else that might not be doing this, it's not really as hard as it might sound, even from a contracting sort of standpoint. But let's think more high level conceptual. This is just more operating on the project level, uh, cadence, you know, sort of level. Um, this is how it might look. So instead, you would have require, let's say a phase, that you have this requirements and envisioning phase. Um, and then you get into your build sprint. Really, you're just starting to do the things right away. And you're wanting to include, what I mean by this build sprint here, is that you're wanting to include your cadences of de internal demo, external demo, you know, UAT, UAT as well, QA and UAT as well. Um, really starting to like deliver on that phase as immediately as possible is, is kind of this idea um, during your phase. <laughs> and then, you know, eventually you're going to get to some sort of deploy and rollout. Now, if it's something that you have multiple phases that you are multiple large features and you're not going to do a full launch, that's not what I mean here, but at least, you know, deploying and rolling out to like a development or staging environment, that sort of thing. But having this high level concept of a of a of phased approach um, just so that you can really you know focus on that agile um, you know reducing burnout um, increasing your team focus increasing your team velocity I think a lot of people that have done agile for an extended period of time this is you know sort of common you know sort of advantages of agile right is to be able to have your reduced risk reduce downtime between sprints you can really think about this you know at the very beginning but one, one thing I wanted to throw out here is another opportunity for your clients as well, is that they can take this value at the end of a phase, especially if you do the contracting based on this sort of phased approach, and go somewhere else if they want to, internally or otherwise. Take that design, and if they decide that you know, they don't want to continue with you developing it, they could take it and, and try to internally or use another resource um, or agency contract to fulfill the next step. But being able to still at least provide that value to increase that uh, sort of rapport. And I think honestly, most clients won't do this. Just because you're giving them the option doesn't mean they're gonna go away. In fact, I think it's the opposite. I think it's the idea that you're being open and honest and transparent and it's their product and you're working with them as a partner. They're gonna come back. They're gonna come back to the next phase. And really an advantage here, and I'll get into this a little bit more, is that you probably are gonna get more money out of the contract at the, uh, at the end of the day, or out of that partner account. Um, but another advantage really is that you can, you know, kind of have this set sort of deliverables, and you can also kind of trade, have this opportunity to trade in and out team members between faces. I think if you have this opportunity, you can be more flexible with your resourcing across your projects. Uh, during certain phases, there might be some more features, you know, focused on front end versus back end, that sort of thing. So it can be another thing you can leverage there. So just to break it up a little bit more and give you a sort of full picture here, um, the, the phase project approach is, is, again, typical of most agile projects. Not only breaks down the work into chunks of easier to swallow work, but allows for working parts to be delivered in their entirety. <laughs> so what do I mean by that? <laughs> Looking at the onion guy diagram here, you can see at the bottom <coughs> there is the phases that you might have. And now these aren't prescriptive, you know, use your own terminology, but I think in general, you're gonna have uh, something very similar here, uh, where you're gonna have, uh, for instance, in the envisioning or requirements in envisioning, uh, you might have deliverables like, in the, in the bubbles here, POC, prototype, technical pro approach document, design, and that might just be high-level design. I've had quite a few projects that I think it's been really valuable during envisioning to have just like this high-level sort of wireframe design, I think you can think of it that way to some degree. Um, maybe decide on some color palette things or fonts or, you know, that sort of thing, uh, just to get into the initial design work. Uh, make sure that everybody's really on board with that sort of vision of the design. And then in the uh, next phase, or during the first part of the initial build phase, 
um, you would want to get into your full level designs. And you might even do, if you can, to be honest, if you can iterate on designs throughout the build process, I think that there's an advantage there as well. So just some things to think about how to chunk it up um, and get your phased approach done here. <coughs> but really the point here is that uh, the previous phase would help to inform the scope of the next phase. So in the, in the example of the envisioning phase, we're informing the build phase. Uh, with the build phase, we're you know, in, informing the next uh, phase to do with implementation or testing, that sort of thing. Uh, there is a reference here if you wanted to take a look at the benefits of prototyping and validation. You know, I think just hit it home there that it's important to have this sort of full cycle about the phase. That's the whole idea here is that you're not just delivering a design. You're delivering maybe, a, you know, an action, a sort of, in a, um, what is, what's the word I'm looking for? A uh, interactive design, prototype, that they're going to be able to click through and see kind of how it behaves, you know, from that workflow perspective. Something more deliverable there. <coughs> And just to go over this in the agile sort of methodology specifically, um, the execution here is that you would have these deliverables. Maybe in your project management uh, tool set, you would be, uh, the deliverables would be set as epics, you know, it could be, or like a feature if you have a higher level, you know, epic available to you in your project management software. Uh, but it's important that before each phase, that you do a couple things. One, that you have your sprints defined within that phase. How many sprints are you doing? Are you going to be working off a scaled agile approach with a planning interval that has 10 week you know, sprintings that are happening? Um, what are your major, but really the point is to get your ideas together about your goals and features before your phase, what those initial requirement or what those requirements are of that phase. And then during your um, planning of that phase, you wanna make sure to include things like um, or have your stories refined and sized during the planning of that phase, that you're identifying your dependencies uh, between the teams as well so that you can schedule out, let's say I have a dependency on this one item, let's not do it the first two sprints, let's do it the second or third sprint, that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> that you've also placed your stories in those sprints. Um, I, I, you know, I think it's hard to do, right? It's not an easy task to to plan out all your sprints for let's say a 10 week period of time in the future, right? But if you think of it of a holistic sort of a st a high level standpoint and you can, can start to put some of those user stories uh, into uh, future sprints, at least to have this general idea, you know, focus more on the user story level um, and have everybody in alignment of like, what do I need to deliver uh, in order to be able to achieve the next uh, you know, team's goal in the next sprint uh, for another feature, then at least they have this sort of now goal versus later goal for their particular team that they can know when to focus early on in sprints versus later on in sprints. So again, high level and breaking it down into smaller. Um, and then during the sprint, you'll have your iteration planning as well, where you're gonna you know, define your tasks specifically, have those leads and make sure that they're leading. You know, it's not the project manager's job to create all the technical approaches for all the user stories or tasks, right? That's the lead's job. And yes, support them if you have the technical background. I've especially had this challenge because I did software development for many years. Uh, but um, I would say that in general, you know, having your leads really take the lead and assign those tasks out to their, uh, their resources on the team is important uh, during those in iteration planning sessions. One other thing to maybe mention here too is that I think if you think from a more holistic standpoint, the problem of estimation, you know, can really, you can solve that a little bit easier because if you're, you're, if you're thinking more like holistically and then on the sprint level, you know, more granularly, uh, you're able to like think more on a estimation in comparison to other work that may or may not be happening in the future. Um, so that might be helpful as well. Some tips here. Um, what did I write down? Sprinting with review feedback provides, uh, and UAT provides an opportunity to rework within the next sprint at a lower cost disruption. Oh, okay. What I was saying here as well is that, you know, if you, you really think about your sprints across, you know, a longer period of time and start really planning out in the future a lot more, um, you can leave room, you know, for for these sort of remediations that might happen, have to happen, or going to have to happen, sprint over sprint as well. 
just to keep that in mind. <clears throat> and in order to control the budget and timeline further, it's recommended to set limitations on the number of rounds. What I was meaning here is that especially like in the design phase, <laughs> I think you can get caught up in uh, tweak hell, you know. I don't like this color or this button position exactly uh, as client feedback, for instance. So if you limit your rounds of UAT to, let's say, two and be more you know, transparent with that with your client, uh, they're going to adhere to that. They're going to get it in 80% you know, wise, you know, more often than not. So setting those expectations up front as well with the client. Um, really, this is all to avoid the throw over the wall syndrome, right? We never want to have a situation where design is designing something, but dev is not in the room. And so we get to dev and, oh, I can't do that. Now we have to throw it back over to design and go back and forth and back and forth. Even though you might have a build phase, for instance, and a design phase, uh, so sp specific focus, it is important to have uh, those leads from the other teams involved, at least for them to see what's coming down the pipeline and ask questions with their internal teams or otherwise <coughs> come back you know, during planning to make sure that um, we're in alignment with what can be accomplished feasibly. I mean, there's always going to be things that happen that you aren't going to be able to control until you start building things, but um, in general. <clears throat> and so just to kind of so, uh, sell this home here, we have our deliverable, and we want to sprint within that deliverable over time uh, in order to achieve uh, our goals with that particular deliverable. So I heard from at least one person that we have uh, uh, done some multi-phase uh, approaches before on projects. Uh, anybody else used a multi-phase approach before on their projects, at least with a discovery, sort of splitting discovery to build maybe a third one with this kind of a polish? Anybody else done that before? Yeah, I, I see a couple nods. Anybody else hasn't done this before? Yeah, no, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Well, if you haven't, um, you know, I, I highly encourage you to explore this, um, even with your sales team to a certain extent. Uh, you know, some of these advantages might be uh, able to, um, uh, you know, have some discovery during that discovery phase that you'll find out that there's an additional feature or two that they really want and love and need. Um, and you have the opportunity to contract for that during, you know, the next phase of that project. A few uh, tips here, let me make sure on my time. Looks like we're still good. So I just wanted to point out a couple things to avoid avoiding burnout here on the internal side. A phased approach, um, you know, again, for agile projects. Um, our cadence and ceremonies might look something like this, um, but in general that you would want to identify your uh, frequency and saturation of those meetings. The idea here is that we're focusing on providing, providing valuable touch points um, during that sprint. Um, so you, again, might not have a daily stand-up, for instance, um, but during your sprinting, um, oh, here, let me back up just a second. What I'm saying here is that you wanna you know, have something that makes sense for the team. So in your sprinting, uh, you know, some of these ceremonies might be uh, things like scrubbing estimation and placement. So this is your planning sort of section, whatever you want to call it. Uh, scrubbing meaning in the backlog that you're refining those uh, particular stories and are breaking down into tasks more granularly, uh, that you're providing that estimation and that you're actually placing it into that sprint as well. Um, those stand-ups that I was talking about, you might have, let's say, uh, team members that are shared across multiple projects, and so you might decide with, you know, and talking to another project manager, uh, that you're going to have the uh, stand-ups during the beginning of the week versus the end of the week or every other day or, you know, whatever seems to make sense uh, for that particular team and project. Uh, you might also want to include demos, and this isn't just demos externally but also internally. <laughs> I've definitely found, especially during the design phase or the initial envisioning phase, to, for this to be important to have internal demos. Uh, so that the internal, uh, the design team can demo to the development team, for instance, and you know do that double check prior to um, uh, sending that out over to the client, and give them time, you know, give them a few days to make uh, some changes if they need to, and not just morning internal demo, afternoon client demo. Give them, give them a little bit of space in order to uh, polish it up. 
Um, also, retrospectives. <laughs> this is something that I think is missed a lot internally, and it's unfortunate when it happens because you'll have this situation if you don't do your retros every sprint, I'm saying. It doesn't have to be a very long meeting. It could be 15 minutes, just like a stand-up. But at least, you know, giving room for everybody to talk about what went well, what didn't go well, what might have gone better, you know, and, and identify some action items to make the sprint, the next sprint better, or the next couple, maybe in a couple sprints you implement something as a team, um, will help to, you know, improve that rapport and avoiding, again, that burnout uh, with your team members as well. Last thing you want is you get to the end of your phase and they, you know, you don't have a retro until then and uh, there's all these things that would have made their lives a lot better um, if we would have talked about it earlier in the phase. Uh, some risks here, again, if ceremonies are neglected, quality and delivery may suffer. So really important on those demos and uh, retrospectives, but those stand-ups are equally important. You know, I think just having it happen more often, you know, talking, getting used to talking about what the issues might be, what they're working on, um, it may not be picked up during the first sprint, or I'm sorry, stand-up of the week, but maybe the second stand-up of the week, you're like, oh yeah, you said that you were having issues with that. Let me get on that with you. See if we can figure that out. Um, <clears throat> one thing to note here as well as an opportunity is that you would want to include those internal meeting times in your contracts if possible. I would say during on the est early estimation side, targeting something like a 25% of implementation in QA is a target that I, I usually uh, set uh, because those internal meetings will take up a lot of time. And I mean, why not just include that? You know, if there's some negotiation that has to happen afterwards, you know, with the client in order to ease that, that's a totally separate thing. But just calling that out at the beginning that your time is valuable and it's important to the, you know, implementation and success of the project to respect that internal time for your team um, is important to include as well, just as a side note. But really, I think the focus on next is kind of what I do uh, as a project manager. Um, if you keep people focused on like what their action items are, what their next uh, tasks are um, that they need to complete in the current sprint or maybe something initially that they need to keep an eye on for the next sprint um, and keeping an eye on that next will keep the momentum as well and avoiding that burnout to some extent. So what kind of ceremonies um, do you plan on implementing? Like, is there one of these that you don't use as much that you might consider taking back and doing more? Anybody? The retrospectives during the projects at Q1. Yeah, just things doesn't things happen. As, retros well. don't happen as much, right, during the <clears> middle. <throat> and I think, you know, if you just have your templating, right, with the, with the what went well, what didn't go well, go around the room and doesn't have to take very long. Have you had situations where you've had sprint, uh, retros during the phase? We or usually schedule them after the project. After and, the project. And it's, it's yeah, probably not going to be helpful to you. It's three weeks later and we're into a different project. And Are you going to use it on the other project? Who knows, right? Right. right. Okay. So you might encourage your project manager to do some retros during your, your project or during your sprinting as well. At the end of the sprint, you know, or the beginning of the sprint, you know, so, somewhere around that cusp. Um, any any ceremonies else? Any demos? People do demos, internal demos specifically. Anybody not do internal demos right now? Okay, well, good. I'm glad that everybody's sharing. So we're all gonna have great projects, and we're gonna get everything done, you know, yesterday, right? So that's good to hear. Um, another uh, aspect here, if I still have a little bit more time, um, a couple minutes. Uh, I'm not gonna go over this really. Um, very much, but just to know that, you know, think about your tools, you know, getting into the flow, things like, um, and other, you know, sort of methodologies, having like good time management for your individual team members. I think I've had the situation a lot that uh, individual team members might not be good at time, their own individual team management. So like showing your screen to show your calendar as a project manager, I have a million things going on all the time, but just showing like how I color code or how I do the things, Get more comfortable, you know, with your teams to share your screens and show how you do something. I don't know how many times I've shared my screen for something internally, and they were like, "Oh, that's cool. What did you get that information? Or how do you do that?" And it will help them. So other things like project organization with with Jira or whatever other tool that you might be using, um, 
uh, browser tab organization. Like, not everybody knows apparently that you can group your tabs, but you can group, group your tabs in almost every browser <laughs> type um, that are, you know, are available today. Um, things like integrations with, and what I meant by this is integrations between like time tracking and your JIRA tool, for instance. There's integrations between uh, email to Slack, email to JIRA, Slack to JIRA, JIRA time tracking with Tempo, for instance. Um, there might be a meeting notes um, on calendar. There's a reclaim uh, uh, to-doist, click up, linear. There's a billion tools, but think about some of those integrations and what might be valuable. Look through those app lists and see, you know, why it might be helpful to you and or your team. Um, status automation, something like reclaim AI or don't interrupt app. Um, this is helpful so that like when you're in a meeting, it'll show up on your Slack that you're in a meeting. And so there's a basic one with Google, but I think some of the other ones um, like Reclaim or Don't Interrupt App are a little bit more comprehensive with like being about, giving out valuable status information. Um, so I won't go much more into this, but as a time management technique, you might you know, think about as well the tactic of the zero inbox where you, you know, and decide if you want to respond or remind yourself to respond later. Uh, just use those. Any other tips or tools that uh, you might use on your desktop that you would like to share today about organization, time management, anything like that? Okay, that's fine. Um, did want to mention that Esteemed is sponsoring my session here today. Uh, they solve resourcing challenges for web projects. Uh, if you need any talent fast um, and to keep your resources on track and thriving, uh, please visit esteemed.io and they have an About Us page if you want to learn more about them. Uh, but more or less, they're a staffing resource talent management group, and I highly recommend that you check them out um, over there. And uh, feel free to reach out to me individually if you have some questions. Also, thank you to our sponsors. We saw this earlier in the welcome, but just again, thank you to our sponsors. Uh, we wouldn't have camps like this um, to share information without them. Um, <laughs> another thing I do off to the side, if anybody is or knows someone who is looking to transition into a new position, uh, looking for job opportunities, networking support tips. I have a LinkedIn group. Uh, you know, feel free to uh, take this down or, or take a screenshot of that um, scan code as well. Uh, we're just a, a, a group of people, about 150 or so at this point. Uh, they're helping out each other. I think I, I'm pretty Drupal heavy as far as my membership is concerned. Uh, but there's others like UX and um, other developer, Python, analytics, there's a lot of different tech sectors that are, that are in this group as well. So uh, if you're looking for a place to uh, talk, you know, I, I do a Monday mess uh, every Monday, just getting together kind of like a stand-up format, talk about what you did last week, what you do, are planning on doing here this week, and any support that you might need in your search for a new opportunity. Um, I'm also going to be uh, doing some uh, warm... I'm calling, I think I'm calling it a warm intro Wednesday. I think I've decided on that. Uh, the idea is that, you know, I think everybody has great resources within their LinkedIn networks, for instance, and they just might not realize, you know, who they can actually leverage in order to get that next opportunity. So being more intentional about doing some of those warm intros on Wednesdays as well. I am also the leader of MidCamp. Uh, we are having our event here next year, May 20, 20th to 22nd in Chicago. Uh, we are going to be focused more on uh, collaboration, training. We're going to do a lot of training. Uh, please join us on midcamp.slack.com, and we're building our sponsorship packages right now as well. So, you know, it might not see a whole lot on there at the moment, but we have a team available to uh, ask some questions for sponsorship. But really, at this point, we're looking for people to participate. So come on in and join us. We're going to be starting up our regular meetings here in a couple of weeks. And uh, please come on if you're a designer, marketer, site builder, or sponsor, and we'd love to have you at MidCamp next year. If you'd like to connect with me, I'll leave this on this slide as well. Again, I'm TechNora everywhere, and feel free to come up if you have any questions. Any, I will pause or close this out at this point. <laughs>